Good morning, ladies. Welcome to Bible study this morning. I'm glad you're here and you faced another morning of snow. Hallelujah. Oh, you know what? We actually can praise God. Yeah, out east, they've had three nor'easters in two weeks, so we really cannot complain about our couple of inches. And it is beautiful. It is beautiful out there this morning. Um, I have a small, it's a very quick activity I'd like for us to do this morning. There are index cards on your table. If everyone would take one of those, grab, I, most of you have a pen or pencil in hand, but grab that. Um, <clears throat> I'd like everyone to have one. I have two questions for you this morning. And I want you to write down just your first response. Okay, this is not a test of any kind. Just write down your first response. Uh, here you see, yes, Tish noticed my jar of jelly beans. They are pretty, aren't they? And a little springy. I'd like you to guess... How many jelly beans? Yes, you can do it. Man, just take a guess. Just take a guess. Uh, take a guess, a wild guess on how many jelly beans are in my jelly bean jar. All right? I'm giving you five seconds. That's it, ladies. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, good. Second question. This is easy. Your favorite worship song, your favorite, and again, what came to mind first, whatever popped into your mind first, just write that down, all right, write that down, your favorite worship song, that can be a hymn, again, just five seconds, we want to make this quick, ladies, five, four, three, two, one, okay, okay. Good job. See, you can do that. That's not hard. If you're still thinking, you can go ahead and jot that down. Um, all right, I want to, let's talk about the jelly beans first. All right, we're going to talk about the jelly beans first. I, I, you know, I don't have time to field everybody's answers, but some, some of you give me how many, what did you guess? Let's see who came closest to the right answer to answer. Abigail, what did you guess? 212? Okay, good guess. Who else? 300. Okay. Marion. 560. Wow. 632. 207. 125. Two more. 275 and 213. Okay. Now, ladies, let's look at this list and see who's closest. And maybe somebody that didn't give their answer is the closest to having the right answer, having the true answer. 576 jelly beans. No. 575, sorry, Mary Ann. Mary Elaine, one out. Unless anybody had 576. Mary, no. So you get a little piece of chocolate. I need the jelly beans for tonight. Sorry, Mary Elaine. <laughs> Okay, that was a great guess. That was an awesome guess. Okay, let's talk about worship songs, ladies. Favorite, favorite songs. And again, I can't field everyone's answers, but give me, give me a few. Yes, Amazing Grace. All right. Thank you, Janie. Another one, Beth. How great thou art. How great thou art. Okay. Blessed be thy name. Maybe a couple more. 
protest and say something like, but Carmen, there is no right answer to that. There is no true answer. That's just a matter of taste or opinion. I have a third question for you. When it comes to choosing what we believe about our faith, what's, what are we more likely to do? Are we more likely to look at it like this jar of jelly beans or like our favorite worship song? I know that's a little confusing. And we're starting off talking about what is relevant truth. What is absolute truth and what is relevant truth? And I'm not, I have a daughter who's a philosophy major. This stuff goes way over my head. I'm just going to be honest with you. But this chapter begs the question for us to look at what is truth and how can we know what is true? Can we know? Okay, in, in our, in our um, prominent philosophy today, in this world of relevant truth, they would say, we can't know for sure how many jelly beans are in here. That how can we really know that 2 plus 2 equals 4? That's the world of relevant truth that we live in. Uh, relevant truth says we absolutely cannot know what is true. And so that begs the questions, ladies. They're making, there's this claim that all truth is relative. All truth is relative. And so that begs us to ask, okay, is that statement, is that claim, all truth is relative? Is that an absolute truth or a relative truth? Because if it's a relative truth, it's utterly meaningless. It's completely meaningless, and it means that we really cannot know if anything is true or not. And isn't that, it, ladies, isn't that exactly where our enemy would like for us to land? That truth is relative? That there is no such thing as truth? This has been his game since the beginning. Since the beginning. Genesis 3.1 Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did he really say? Did he truly say? Are you certain he said you cannot eat from any tree in the garden? What's he doing? He's planting this seed of doubt in truth, questioning what is true. And Eve goes on, uh, she says, and the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So God had set his absolute truth right there, right? Don't touch that tree. Don't eat it. Um, probably even best, don't even look at it. But just don't touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, oh, You will not surely die. You will not really die. You will not truly die. Planting that seed of doubt 
in what is true and what is right. Our enemy is a wily one, he is. He likes for us to question what is true and what is right. We've had this, um, we've had this theme of truth all throughout the Gospel of John. I don't think we've taken much time to land on truth. We've talked about these themes of um, light versus dark, good versus evil, life versus death. But we also have this theme of uh, truth versus lies. And it's been throughout. I, you know how I always like to take us back to the prologue. And we see this theme of truth all the way back there. John 1, 9, uh, for the true light was coming into the world that all might believe through in him. Uh, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son, full of what? Full of grace and truth. John 1, 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. No one has ever seen the true God, but who is at the Father's side? Jesus has made him known. That's what... That's what Jesus does. We, um, we, this, the, when we look at the word true and understand the meaning of that word truth, it means what is certain, what is sure, but the Greek word has kind of this underlying dynamic to it as the original language often does. And it means to disclose that which has been concealed. Disclose that which has been concealed. Isn't that what Jesus does? That last verse, John 1, 18, tells us he has made him known. He, Jesus, has disclosed the one true God. This theme of truth is throughout John. We see the word true 23 times, the word true 22 times, truly, truly 26 times. There's a lot in here about truth. Back in John 8, we saw Jesus turn to the Jews who had believed in him. And he said this, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You are true disciples. And you will know the truth. And what? The truth will set you free. And just a few verses later, he turns to the Jews who have not believed. And here's what he said to them. And ladies, I, this still makes me tremble. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and a father of lies. That's Jesus calling out our enemy. Father of lies, lies, falsehood, deceit, dishonesty, untruthfulness, half-truths. He speaks lies, and a lie is never of Christ, is it? Never of Christ, never of the light. Lies are of the devil, that's his language. Lies are of the dark. We've compared and contrasted all along, and we, we've said, I've stood on this side and said, if we believe we're over here, we're in the light, and belief equates with life, it equates with light, um, it equates with good. And today I'm adding in there truth. This side is truth. When, when we don't believe, that equates to death, to dark, to evil, and to lies. And boy, ladies, 
does that come out here in John chapter 18? This is a disturbing chapter. I want to give you hope before I dig into and we kind of unpack some of the lies here and, and grapple with it to understand uh, what our bent is and how easily we are deceived. Because I could be Peter, I could be one of the Jews, I could be Pilate. I've, I've, I've been deceived in all the ways that they have. But before we do that, I just I want to remind us that uh, where we're headed to, where John has taken us and where we're headed, we've been through the first book, the first half of John, the first 13 chapters, that was the book of signs. John has shown us who Jesus is, his miracles, his signs, his words. And last week we wrapped up this farewell discourse with Christ's final prayer. And it gave us a window into Christ's heart, a window into what's on his heart, his concerns. What would he pray for just before he goes to the cross? I loved that, ladies. Today gives us, this chapter, I believe, chapter 18, gives us a window, a window into, um, into this battle between, kind of the unseen battle between the truth and the father of lies. The battle between truth and lies. I grappled with this chapter. I really grappled how to, uh, what to bring up, what to talk about. And I can tell you it's not fun to talk about lies, ladies. It's not fun to think about it. It's not fun to wrestle with the scripture and, and delve into a world of lies. And my kids would tell, they would tell you if they were here. You want to you wanna send Mama Beasley over the edge? Tell her a lie. Want the wrath of mama, tell her a lie. If my kids came to me and they, they, they wanted to confess something, you know, there were still consequences, but there was grace because they came to me and brought it out into the light. I think we have to look at the lies in order to understand how glorious the light is. So ladies, just briefly, let's take a look at the various characters we have here in chapter 18. Number one, we have, we have Jesus. And I want to remind us that back in John 14, 6, Jesus said to us, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. So we can call Jesus the truth with a capital T. He is the truth. But Jesus also came to bear witness to the truth, to point people to the real truth, to the one true God. And this is not some kind of abstract concept of truth, sort of like we touched on with relevant truth. This is not abstract truth over and against falsehood. But this truth is closely related to Christ's person, to who he is, to his character, and even his mission is one of truth. The witness that he bears elicits a response from every one of us on the side of truth, on the side of light and goodness and life. Jesus is truth and he shows us the way to walk in truth of, as well and i ladies will read some scripture here but i gotta say i was stunned in the moment of his suffering he is not rattled or shaken here in the moment of his greatest suffering he is not rattled or shaken uh, john 18 1 when Jesus had spoken these words, he had just prayed the prayer that we discussed last week. 
He went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place where Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, full of truth. He's not hiding in the dark. He knows they're coming for him. What does he do in truth? He steps forward. He steps forward. Whom do you seek? He knows who they're seeking. We're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. He speaks the truth. He stands forward in truth. And they fall backwards, don't they? Christ comes forward in truth. He's able to stand firm in truth. Why, ladies? We've talked about this time and time again. He understands his identity, who he is, that he is from the Father, and he's going back to the Father. He knows his purpose. This is why he came, to go to the cross. And he stands firm in truth. He's not held captive here. He is willingly bound by them in order to accomplish his mission, in order to lay down his life. Where Christ has peace and humility and faithfulness and he's completely others focused, he's taking care of his disciples here, let these men go. In the moment of his suffering, he's completely others focused. We can contrast this by the other characters that we see in this chapter. Peter, the Jews, Pilate. And ladies, what we're gonna see, I think, I think we see over and over again, these characters display fear, pride, and self-preservation, self-interest. And always, always, I believe, when there is fear, when there's fear, pride, or self-preservation, selfishness, lies are lurking in the corner. Lies are lurking in the corner. So how do we, what, you know, I want us to look at these next characters with this in mind. How do we, how do we become, looking at them in order to ask the question, how do we become ensnared um, to believing lies over believing the truth? Has that happened to you? Believing a lie versus believing the truth? Boy, it does me. And when I find I'm afraid or I'm giving way to fear and anxiety, I'm believing some kind of lie. What maybe will happen, what could happen, what all these things that I'm imagining in my mind. So let's take a look at this. Verse 10, we have Peter. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Peter, how is Peter deceived? What, what, how, how's he entrapped here? What's he buying into? I kind of see, I, I kind of see this as, as Peter's going to do it his way. Christ has his mission and way of doing things, but. Peter's going his own way, and oh, Peter, 
Like, how is it that every single one of us in this room can relate to you, Peter? Going our own way. We're going to fight this battle our way. I don't know about you ladies, but when I go my own way, I usually end up in trouble. Why? Because I've taken my eyes off of the way, the truth, and the life. When I look at Peter, I have to ask myself, okay, am I just going my own way? Am I deceived and taken my eyes off of Christ and his way? Because ladies, when I do that, you know what happens? I end up chopping off ears. I end up chopping off ears. Now I hope none of us have swords that we're wielding in our book bags here, like Peter does, but I got a sword right here, a sword right here in this mouth. And I can wield it in such a way as to cut off ears. Am I following God's way or my own way? Verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus. And ladies, let's give him some credit here. He's got some courage. He did pull out the sword. He follows Jesus. It's easy to slam Peter here because we know he denies the Lord three times. He's got some skirt courage. He's got some spunk. Simon Peter follows Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. I am not. For this section, can't we contrast the I am versus the I am not? The I am versus the I am not. Jesus stands forward in truth to say, I am he. Peter shrinks back to say, I am not. Ladies, um, with this section, I just decided I can't judge Peter here. He showed some courage. He followed Jesus. What hurts, what's so painful, what's so tragic is that Peter believes in Jesus, just like we believe in Jesus. And he betrays him. He denies him. Under the right circumstances, that could be me. Under the right circumstances, that could be any one of us. I'm glad we have the whole story because we can look at this and can't we see, we will see, God uses this for Peter's good. And he uses it for our good. I mean, Peter is protected here. Peter becomes the rock of the church. Peter is broken here. Well, we can look at the synoptic gospels and see that after Peter denies Christ three times before the rooster crows, just as Christ had predicted, what does Peter do? He wept. He wept bitterly according to the synoptic gospels. Peter is broken. God uses it for his good. Why? Peter had a little pride to him. A little arrogance. I'll do it my way. I know how to do this, Lord. Psh. Peter is broken, and his pride is replaced with humility. With humility. Next, we have 
the Jews. Verse 28. Mm, no, 19. Let's start at 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong, bear witness to the truth. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Again, Jesus, the truth, speaking truth. And he's not being disrespectful here at all. Jesus is asking for a fair trial. There is nothing legal about this trial that's happening in secret, at nighttime, in the dark, spun by with evil intentions for his murder. It's a complete scam, ladies. Jesus is just asking for a fair trial if we were to put on our first century glasses, we would know that you had at least two witnesses. And Jesus is saying, "Ask, get the bring in the witnesses here. When we look at the Jews, and I lump Judas in here too, ladies, because he aligns himself with that. And when I say Jews, I'm referring to the Jewish leaders here. When we look at them, um, wow, they, they disbelieve. They disbelieve. That, 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 that's the trap that they're caught in. One is disbelief. And they've had time. We've talked about this. They've had time and time and time and time. Jesus has given them, oh, okay, bajillion. I know that's not a word. But he's given them so many times to believe. And what has happened, we've talked about how hearts become hardened. They are hardened to the truth. They are now blind to the truth. And in order to maintain what they want, they, in order to maintain control, how many of us have ever tried to maintain control over something? In order to maintain control and power in their own way, they utilize deceitful manipulation. They manipulate things ever try to manipulate something to control it thank you for being honest and nodding yes and yeah they are frenzied in fear here they're doing all that they can to hold on to the control that they have to the power that they have. And we could, when we look back, if we look back into John chapter 12, we would see they, even at that point, they were wanting to murder Lazarus because oh, poor Lazarus was just, Christ raised him from the dead and now they want to murder him. Remember, when there's fear, anxiety, pride, manipulation, wanting to hold on to control, there's usually a lie lurking somewhere in the corner. John told us back in John chapter 3, verse 18, or this is 19, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. And ladies, I think I don't have a lot to say about this. I'm not, I'm still grappling with it. I always feel when I'm teaching like, oh, wow, Lord, I just, I need another week or two to solidify these ideas. But, you know, this trial and, and the Jewish leaders, they're working in the dark here. They're working in secret. And there, there's just something sinister. There's something evil about things 
that take place in the dark. They need, whatever's in the dark needs to be exposed. My application for that is bring it to the light. Don't live in the dark. Bring it to the light. There is grace. There is freedom. There is light. There is life when we expose lies to the light. Let's take a look at Pilate. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Ladies, do you see how twisted the lies are, how deceived they are that they won't enter his, his headquarters so they can eat the Passover meal, but it's okay to bring an innocent man to be murdered. I mean, this is what happens when we stay in the dark and when we spin lies and believe lies and they spin in our head, they just, they get out of control. Twenty-nine, so Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. You know what, can I just stop right there? I just had this thought. Every time we see this so frequently in these chapters, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken or that God had spoken. That's pointing us to what? To truth. What is true? What had been said about God and then what takes place about him. Every time we see that this was to fulfill the word, again, that speaks to this theme of truth. Verse 33, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus to him. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Isn't it interesting how Jesus has this conversation with Pilate? Oh, he loves to the end. He goes right into teacher mode. Pilate asks him a question. Jesus asks him a question back. He goes into teacher mode. Why? He wants Pilate to know the truth. Verse 37, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate answers, what is truth? I bet that took every one of us back to today. Isn't that the question of the day? What is truth? That hasn't changed since the beginning. That's just what the serpent wanted Eve to think. What is truth? Pilate's trapped here in this idea of relevant truth. What is truth? But he's also deceived in another way that I believe that we're very apt to be deceived, ladies. He's deceived into people-pleasing. How many of you have ever been trapped by people-pleasing? Thank you, Bethany. <laughs> Pilate. He knows full well he's being manipulated by the Jewish leaders. He doesn't like it at all. 
But in the end, and we'll see more of this in the next chapter, in the end, he chooses what? He chooses to placate the Jewish leaders and to please Rome. And by doing so, what does he do? He ignores the absolute truth that is right in front of his face. He turns his back and he goes out amongst the leaders again. He knows there's no guilt. This is truth in front of him. Again, with Pilate, what do we see? There's a little bit of fear. So maybe more than a little bit of pride and arrogance. Selfishness, self-preservation. Whenever we see those things, whenever there's fear, anxiety, pride, self-preservation, there's always a lie lurking in the corner. I think that's a common denominator among the characters that we see in this chapter. And the truth gets spun into something like relevant truth, making the truth say what I want it to say. What is truth, ladies? Pilate's question, what is truth? John's been showing us all throughout this gospel. Here he is. Truth is Jesus Christ. He's been showing us all along. Back, uh, back in John chapter 1, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here's the one who turns water into wine. Here's the living water. Here's the one who uh, healed the lame man and made him walk again. Here's the one that fed the multitudes. Here's the bread of life. Here's the one that helped the blind man see. We talked about who can do that? Only the one true God can give man his sight, let alone raise a man from the dead. John's been showing us all along through Christ's works. Here's the one true God. Here is truth. Why? Because he wants us to believe. He's been pointing us to where we're going. We said we're going to John 20, 31. But these were written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And what? That by believing you might have life in his name. All along, John's been taking us to truth so that we can stop believing the lies. We can stop being deceived. We can let go of our fears and our anxieties. We can let go of our pride, manipulative ways, self-preservation, the need for control. Those are all bundled up over here. Dark lies, death. John's been pointing us to truth. Why? So that we can enjoy it. Enjoy it and enjoy it to the full abundantly. Let's pray, ladies. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you for being the, the way and the truth and the life. We praise you for being our conquering hero. God, today as we grapple with chapter 18 and chapter 19, Lord, it looks like darkness is going to win and the lies are going to win. We just thank you and praise you that you overcame. You are victorious. And so, Lord, we can claim that as we pray to you. Jesus, I love how 
um, you came forth. You came forth to this world as the truth. And here in chapter 18, we see how you came forward to say, I am he. So strong, so true. God, would you help us to be brave, to be bold, and allow you to shine your light over every crevice of our mind, over every crevice of our heart, Lord, that your light would expose any lies that we're believing in, any way that we're deceived, Lord. I pray for each of us, God, that we could completely turn over our need for control, our need to manipulate our, our fears and our anxieties to you, Jesus, and that you would replace any lie that we're believing as, as it's exposed to you, you would replace it with your light, with your truth with your peace. God, I pray for each and every woman who is taking part in this study, that Jesus, just as your identity is firmly grounded, intertwined with the Father, you know you came and you, your purpose, you accomplished your mission because you know who you are and you're so intricately uh, abiding with the Father. Lord, may that be us. Help us to abide in you, to abide in the true vine and abide in your truth. So that ultimately your name will be glorified, Lord, and your will will be accomplished. We love you so much. May you guide the conversations around our tables today. May your truth reign, and may your life and your light reign here, reign sovereign. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you, ladies.